Hey all, it's Jeffrey, and I've been a bit under the weather this past week, so instead of what we planned, we're going to re-air an interview with Abby McEnany, the star of Work in Progress on Showtime. This originally aired on the Luminary app when the show first premiered, and it is now back for its second season. Abby is the creator and star of the series, a self-described fat queer dyke. And I think you're going to love hearing from her as much as I did. So please enjoy. You know, I'm sure it exists, but I think this is the first time I've seen a butch woman be the lead of a TV show. Yeah, I mean, I think so. It's funny because I'm always hesitant to be like, yeah, it's never been done before. And then everybody comes out. Are you fucking kidding me? You didn't know about that? So like, yeah, I I think it is rare, I would say. I think also, I think a lot of it's like older and fat and masculine and queer. Like, I think that's kind of new that they gave me the opportunity to be the lead, you know? I was always like, okay, well, maybe I can be at a, you know, a supporting role in, you know, something. So this is just a dream, you know? You mentioned your age. I think it's kind of moving actually to see somebody at your age who is, you know, gender Uh nonconforming. Yeah. Because I think that we've inadvertently created this narrative that young people have created gender (laughs) nonconformity. And that somehow like they invented it themselves and it's brand new. And that's not the case. Well, you know what? That's so interesting. I think that's correct. It's not the case. However, what I find beautiful about it is that if somebody's going to be gender non-binary or gender non-conforming or whatever, like they won't be the only one. And like, it won't be weird. And so like, I think everything is, um, I call it a queer wonderland. Like when, uh, like in uh, one of the episodes, uh, my boyfriend takes me to this party, this queer party. And so when we were writing it, I was like, so it's like this queer wonderland. It's like uh, queers of all different sexual identities, gender identities, all races, abilities, sizes, you know, it's just like this like wealth of uh, openness and, and and stuff. And I think, uh, yeah, so I, I think it's exactly right. It wasn't invented by youthful queers, but boy, is it being championed. How about that? It's yeah. been championed and, and just like everything seems, I mean, again, this is from a very privileged point of view. And like, I'm from, you know, I'm living in a city and I'm like, I feel like I am embraced. But I have a lot, I know like queer places and stuff like that. So I, I just want to say like, I know I'm very lucky by that, but it is embraced by that. And it wasn't as much in the olden days of the 80s and 90s. <laughs> I mean, like maybe you are privileged, but you also do deal with like being misgendered. Oh, sure. Oh yeah. When I say, I just want to say like, I never, I just want to be very aware that even with everything that we like, that I deal with as a person, like I still have amazing, I don't want to be like, oh, because there, there's a clip that they've been showing in a in a trailer that says, my life's worse than everybody else's or my life's harder. And I was like, I hope people know that this is like, I don't really believe that. That's a char- my character at a really low point and not being a very good person, you know? Yeah, of That's course. what I mean. Yeah, no, I mean, totally. So yeah, I mean, certainly there's been a lot of crap. There's still a lot of crap. With like the example of being misgendered, which mm-hmm. we see in the TV show, how often would you say that happens to you? Well, you know, when my depression's really bad, it happens less because I don't leave the house as much. Classic. Um, I would say it happens anywhere. I mean, sometimes seven times a week or or four times. I mean, I don't know. It happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I have to say like... Uh, Generally, like I, you know, I I want to be masculine presenting, right? Like, so I understand when people are like, oh, sir, and I'm like, oh, you know, and they hear my voice or, or uh, I say, oh, I'm not a sir, and they're, it's like, oh, sorry, I'm like, I don't care, you know, it's all about respect. A lot of this reminds me of the SNL character Pat, which you talk yes. about in the show a lot. Yes. Um, in the show, your character says that Pat made your life a living hell. Yes. Just for the younger generation, yeah. I think that character has <laughs> been lost on people. Could yes. you just explain who that was? Sure. Uh, so Pat uh, was a character. And the premise of the character is that Pat is very aware of their gender, but nobody else knows what Pat's gender is. And so... The way that it was set up on SNL is that the the premise is like, oh, isn't that hilarious? Like, is that a man or a woman? And and that's hilarious. And a little bit gross. Oh, for sure gross. For sure. It's, I mean, that's what, yeah. But, and I have to say, like, at the time, I mean, I thought Pat was hilarious, right? Like, I was like, woo. I mean, also, it was a long time ago and I was younger and I didn't get stuff. But when it started turning into something that (laughs) ruined my life was when I started being called Pat once I like started to be like more embracing my like my my queerness and my masculine dress and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm I'm fat and like I have like I used well now I have really gray hair, but it used to be, you know, dark and short, but like whatever. 
And I think people would be like, oh, yeah, I bet it was like a lot of straight guys in Lincoln Park that like, which is, you know, a very like it's not just them. I was called Pat by a lesbian in a lesbian bar in the 90s. And it's like, wow, especially back then, it was like it was really important. I mean, it's, it's still important to find safe space now, but it, just as society, people are more and more accepting where I live. But boy, that that's heartbreaking. So then, you know, that really made me think like the lesbian, the word, but like the idea of a lesbian community, that's a misnomer because like I can't even go to a safe space and feel safe. I'm being insulted by the way I look and how I'm presenting myself. It's like, are you kidding me? Has, yeah. that, has that changed in lesbian spaces? Well, I have to say lesbian spaces are disappearing. That's I mean, a great point. it is. I mean, I can't, I mean, there used to be a bunch of lesbian bars in Chicago and, and I can't name one. Also, just I just have to say, I, get, I don't identify as a lesbian anymore. I d- identify as queer dyke or a queer woman. So there's some <laughs> there are people like, lesbians don't tra- date trans men. I'm like, I know, I'm queer. Anyways, I just had to get that out there. Yeah, there aren't any, there's, uh, there aren't any lesbian spaces that I can find or they're very disappearing and that's horrible. And then a lot of queer spaces have lost some of the, the safety. I don't know, it's, I don't know the safety, but it's just like, one time, we, uh, my friend and I, Kareem, were at the, one of the best bars in the world. It's called Big Chicks in, in Chicago. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's amazing. What's up, Big Chicks? It seemed like one time these these group of straight folks came in and like these people were like treating us like zoo animals. Like, oh my God. Sometimes like we can't even have like a sacred space of safety. I want to well, go back to Pat before we move on. Oh yeah, oh my gosh, right, right. I, I, um, just because yeah. that was such a widely known character yeah. that oh, had yes. a cultural significance yes. that surprises me. It was even mentioned in the recent Supreme Court case. Can you believe I, I saw that I was like what is happening yeah yeah and so Julia Sweeney who played Pat she's on your TV show yes. playing Julia Sweeney yes did you have a backup plan in case she didn't want to do the show well it was funny because Tim Mason who's my co-creator and co-writer like so in my storytelling show it started like you know Pat Julia Sweeney's Pat made my life a living hell that's how the story started and and we were going to include like that story like the idea and and Julia Sweeney like lived in the North Shore of Chicago at the time and he was like, well, let's just write her in. I'm like, we're never going to get her. He's like, no, nah, we'll just write her in. And then like a month before we're going to shoot, we're like, we better reach out to her. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. And I didn't like, Tim was kind of like, well, we're going to have to rewrite a lot. I'm like, it's really not that big of a rewrite because we were just for the pilot, right? She said yes right away. She is the most generous, loving person. We are dear friends. It's funny. Like, I, I, I love her so much. She's so amazing, has given so much of the project. And what I love about it is that we don't see eye to eye on everything, you know? Like, we do not see eye to eye on certain things. And I have to say, that's fantastic in a way, because the thing about social media that really bugs me is that people are immediately villainized or, like, called evil because of a misstep. And some missteps are on purpose and some missteps are mistake. And people, a lot of people are willing to learn and hear like, wow, I fucked up. Tell me like, what can I, like, I want to be a better person. I like, I want to be a better person. I want to become, I mean, I want to become less classist, less racist, less misogynist, less fat phobic, less homophobic, less transphobic. Like I'm all the phobics, you know, I'm all those, mis- like I'm all that stuff, right? But I think in the current climate that there's not a lot of opportunity for conversation and learning and having discourse and conversations and it being okay to not exactly agree with every single person. And that doesn't make somebody a villain or evil, you know? And I think all this shit that happens online, things are immediate, like people are immediately branded a certain thing. And I have to say, like, (laughs) I fuck up all the time and I want to be in a place that people, we, that I can learn and God continue to be become a better person. Like, you know, I'm open to that. And and uh, you fuck up all the time and I like so does everybody else. Exactly, about, right. I mean, and the th- yeah, I mean, right. And with the character Pat. Yes, oh, yes, uh, we go yes, back. Sorry, I keep on changing. No, why are you apologizing? <laughs> no, no, I don't know, because I always do. Okay, I'm moving on. <laughs> but, but Pat did come out in a different time. And I think it's so interesting that now, were there to be a character on TV like Pat, where we didn't know the gender, the next fall up line would be like, hey, what are your pronouns? Exactly like, right. That cultural understanding didn't I exist. I mean, it didn't exist. And also it wouldn't be the joke. Like the whole the whole premise of that was like, oh my God, isn't isn't that person a freak? Because oh my gosh, we don't know what to say around this person. And so it was a freak. It wasn't a human being. Oh, because that joke actually wouldn't exist it anymore wouldn't exist. if we said we don't know their gender. Like there wouldn't be a punchline. It wouldn't there's no punchline. It'd be like, hey, um, my my pronouns are she, her. What are your pronouns? That oh. is a big change. You know, it, it's just like it just yeah. exists. Or, or like or it would exist in a very unappealing way. You know? That's a great point. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
When you say that you now uh, describe yourself as a queer dyke, yes, there's a line in the TV show yes. that I'm not a lesbian because <laughs> lesbians are old women. Yeah. I was trying to figure out like how much of that what uh, is a joke for something you actually used to think. Okay, you know, and I find identity fascinating. Me too. And I think you know, I I love um, especially like for me, and it's only in like the last I don't know three years the idea or four years I can't remember the idea of fluidity. You know, like gender fluidity, sexual sexuality, fluidity, all that stuff. I think that's such a beautiful idea. And I love that idea. Like you can be fluid. It doesn't matter. Like things can change. And so my identity, like, right. Like I came, like when I came out, I, of course, classic 22 year old, I'm a bisexual and I'm not against bisexuals. I just don't identify as one. I think bisexuals get a bad rap. And then I never felt like, you know, like a lesbian lesbian. Cause I still was attracted to, to some men Okay, so so then I was I defined myself as a lesbian, and then I dated this wonderful woman, Liz. She was eleven years younger than me, and I referred to us as lesbians in some comment. She's like, "I'm not a lesbian. Lesbians are old women." I'm like, "What?" Okay, because I was like, I can't give her more evidence that I'm so much older than her. So then I was like, "Okay," and also I think the word dyke is very powerful, and I feel like dykes can do whatever the fuck they want. And also lesbians, can, I did this piece in my show about identity, right? And and I was like, also this is how I see it. Anything you say now is like, that's not what lesbians are. So I find lesbian to me is also not what I am. But anyways, dyke seems like you can do whatever the fuck you want. Then I started dating a young trans man. And if I was still referred to as a lesbian, I'm totally negating Alex's gender. Alex isn't a woman. Alex is a man. So then... I was like, okay, I'm queer. Like I made a queer dyke for myself. I'm like, I'm queer, I'm dyke identified, makes sense to me. People are like, what does that mean? I'm like, uh, makes sense to me. But so those two things came from very specific things. But yeah, the the because Liz was like, lesbians are old women, I'm like, oh God. <laughs> like, oh shit. That's I, really funny. Yeah. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. And in the show, we do see you dating a trans man. Yes. Um, played by Theo Germain. Yes. Theo is non-binary. The character is a trans man. Yes. Um, the character also presents a little gender non-conforming. Yes. And I think that's so powerful to see um, gender non-conformity, be it a butch woman or mm-hmm. a non-binary person or a trans man, to see that being sexualized. Because, you know, I think we sexualize trans women only, but when it comes to gender nonconformity, we don't see people expressing like sexual desire. Yeah, it is funny because Theo was our first actor that came in to audition. And we had been working on this project for about two years. And like, I mean, the second Theo left, we were like, Whew. this is a lot about Abby's learning. We use Chris's pronouns are he, him. Theo's pronouns are they, them, now also he, him. But, you know, it's like, it didn't matter if this character was identified as he, him, or they, them, or whatever. Like, okay, so we could we changed all of that yeah. to fit the person. Because it was like, we have this opportunity to show real queers and to give the beautiful community that we are part of an opportunity to be like in a, in a show that they haven't had the opportunity to be themselves before on screen. And I, I think... Um, that's that to me has been really probably the most powerful thing, you know. Yeah, and we see one scene with you and Theo's character talking about having sex. Yes, and <laughs> and the character is saying like what body parts they feel yes. comfortable with you touching, yes. how they feel comfortable with you describing yes. certain body parts, and it was one of the most frank discussions of sexuality with trans people I've yeah. seen on screen, and I just thought it was so important because you are modeling a response which is like okay, great, right. I don't need to touch your chest, right. which is like no pressure. Right. When I think that people think there's so much pressure having sex with trans people. Right. And a lot of that is like, that was my experience. And I thought it was so powerful. Like when I was with my boyfriend at the time, Alex, like it was, it was just, it's like, okay, great. It's like, okay, these are are like right on. Like this makes, you know, this doesn't change how I feel about you. It's not going to change like how we have, like it's going to not going to change how I feel about having sex with you or you having sex with, you know what I mean? And it was just this thing is like set out boundaries, set out respect. And then it lets down all these like fears, you know? And I just think, yeah. And in that case too, like with that example, the show functions as the antidote to Pat. On SNL. Yeah, exactly right. And yeah. to like the history of trans representation, <laughs> which is a man kissing a trans woman and then vomiting. Right, right. Exactly right. And, and also we wanted to show, because in the pilot when I, you know, I miss I misgender uh, Chris and I was like, oh, I haven't been out with an attractive woman in a long time. And Chris says, actually, I'm a trans man. And I go, well, I haven't been out with an attractive trans man in ever. In real life, this happened over email with me and Alex. I was like, okay. We didn't want to be like, oh my gosh, what does this mean? It's a human being. I'm very attracted to them. 
It's just kind of a fact. It's like, and it doesn't matter. I think somebody asked me once, and I can't remember where they're from, but it was like, um, tell me how a relationship between a lesbian and a trans man works. And of course, that's misidentifying me. I was like, like, how does that work? And I was like, uh, it's two human beings who are into each other. What I mean, it's just weird. It's like, what do you mean, how does it work? Like, what is, like, it's two human beings that are into each other. You know what I mean? I think he was like, uh, what do you do? You know? And it was oh, just yeah. like, we're human beings. Like, what do you mean? You know? <laughs> and, and so, like, the show, if they watch it, then they see. Right? Right, right. And I think, yeah, it would be funny because, like, Tim, Lily, and I, we'd be in the writing room. And it was just the three of us that wrote because we had to, we started writing right away. We didn't have, like, a finalized deal or anything. But we're like, we got to go because we know we're going to go fast. And... And sometimes we'd be writing, we're like, wait, does this sound like a TED Talk? (laughs) Because we didn't want to be, we just wanted to show real life, you know? We didn't want to be like, this is the way it is. And also, I have to say, some people won't like the what I'm saying, right? And that's okay. Like, I know, I'm sure I got stuff wrong. And I bet, like, some people think I got stuff right, and I think I got it right. They won't like it. That's okay, you know? But that's why I love seeing you misgender this character, because it's like, yeah, not even the queers all get it right all the time. Right. Right, exactly right. Even in that scene, like when um, in the charades, when they're like, who's a man, Abby's new girlfriend? And it's just like, that's not coming from hate. It's just coming from not knowing, not knowing trans people and not knowing what the language is, you know? And it's, it's just like, okay, and these are friends of mine. And they're like, okay, this is new for everybody. We're going to figure it out. And that was kind of how it was, you know? Yeah. While writing the show, did you ever debate whether or not to change the character's name from Abby to a different character name? It's hilarious. Um, We kind of never, we probably should have debated it. (laughs) Because the character's name is Abby McEnany. Oopsies. Um, Oh, it's your first and last name. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, that's... uh, I don't know if that was well thought out. There was a lot of other stuff on my mind, Jeff. I asked that because <laughs> people have an issue separating out actors yep. from the characters they yep. play, let alone actors from the characters they play that it's their own life experience right. with the same name. Right, I know. It's so funny. I was like, you really could have thought of that more. I just think it was funny because like the show was born out of this storytelling show, which was like 55 minutes of real life stories for me, right? And I think it was just in, in our mind, like a natural progression to like, now I'm like, oh God. I mean, it's hilarious. I did change like my... My family's names <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> we changed a lot of stuff about my family. and It's so funny that you describe yourself as a mess. Uh-huh. <laughs> because to, for me, there's like a disconnect there because what you were able to accomplish w- with Work in Progress, mm. you co-created it with Tim Mason, mm-hmm. your co-creator. Yep. You wrote it, produced it, got it funded, shot it, got accepted to Sundance, mm-hmm. got Lily Wachowski on board. <laughs> yeah. She's one of the Wachowski siblings uh, from The Matrix. Yeah, the best. Then you got a Showtime series pickup. Yeah. That was really fast. And then also on top of that, you created something really good. Um, oh, to thank me, you. That's, that's, that's really kind. Thank you. Yeah, I mean that. I, yeah, well, you're I appreciate welcome. it. Thank you. And so to me, like to be able to accomplish all that, I don't get how someone can be a mess. <laughs> Well, you know, I think that I come by, you know, I just think, you know, I haven't, I haven't had a, like, I haven't had a career for, I've been improvising since like I was 24, 25 and I haven't ever, you know what I mean? I'm just saying like, you that's were what very I mean. well known in the Chicago improv space though. I mean, yeah. I mean, like when you improvise for a long time there, people know who you are. And also I think <laughs> like, it's really hard for me to say like, yeah, I think also when I say it like a walking mess, like I always get out of the car and I spill coffee. I'm like, well, I'm glad I'm not getting my picture taken, you know, and I get on a plane and I'm like dropping my water bottle. I mean, I am a clumsy mother. Fucker. You know what I mean? I just like, I am a, I'm, I'm a mess, but I'm okay. You know, I just think like, also when you put it out there, it's just like, all right, I don't think I'm anything I'm not, you know what I mean? And I think when it was so great when we got to pitch it, people had seen the pilot, right? So I walked into these rooms and I didn't have to pretend to be anybody I wasn't because they saw the screeching, like, ah, I don't know what I'm doing. Woman in a 24 hour, a 24 hour, holy crap, a 24 minute pilot and I walk in and it's not like, I know exactly what you're talking about. I was like, what does that mean? You know, and I'm next to Lily Wachowski, who's a fucking warrior. She is beautiful person, a warrior, my supporter, my backbone. She's powerful. She gives zero crap about how crap works. She's like, I'll speak my mind. And I don't know. It's been like, so that was just crazy. And I would be like in these meetings, like, I can't believe I'm not as, I should be way more nervous, you know? And that was a gift, you know, that I... It's been a gift that I haven't had to pretend I was somebody else. I guess when you make a TV show with a character with your exact name, <laughs> uh, somebody who you know talks about all the issues she's facing, mm-hmm. someone who kills her therapist inadvertently <laughs> in the first scene, maybe there's not a lot to hide. I know that's true. That's true. And I, it's funny. Like I was talking yesterday about Hannah Gatsby, and and I find her just 
that, you know, Nanette was just the most powerful piece of art I'd, I'd seen. And, and um, you know, what she says about she refuses to self use self-deprecating humor anymore. And, and that to me, I'm going to get Misty talking about, like that to me is so powerful. And I, I, and I like, I'm like, oh, I'm doing a disservice because I'm very self-deprecating, you know, like, but a lot of that, I, I, a lot of, I, I come by it by setting up safety, right? Like I've always been fat. I've always been like conventionally unattractive and like, and loud. And I, I've never fit and I'm never, I'm always in the way and stuff. So like, there's a lot of like comedy and like, and self-deprecation that sets me up. So I protect, it's like setting up an armor. I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working on it. And I also, when I talk about like, I have no shame about like my mental illness or my gender my gender identity or my sexuality. And I have immense shame about fat, being fat, like immense, immense, immense. And like, I look at Lindy West and Roxane Gay and uh, Aidy Bryant, who I used to perform with, who's so beautiful and, and so powerful and just so funny. And I look at those women, I'm like, you are so smart and brave. And I just wish I was like that and I'm not. And like, when when we do the show, I'm like, oh God, like, I know I'm doing a disservice like by like worrying about my fat. I'm just telling the truth, right? Like my truth and my goal is to, hopefully show people out there struggling that there's a life without shame out there. And I'm not saying I'm living it, but that's the goal, <laughs> right? You putting the show out there yeah. with this, as you say, a fat character right. who's the lead role, that will do enough to like help other people, I mean, even if you don't believe right, for right. yourself. Exactly right. And I think really like there is a fat, gray haired, masculine woman who is the lead of a show. Like that is bonkers. That opportunity is revolutionary. And and with Lily, like, you know, and this, and the love care, it was with a, a, a trans person. Like, that to me, I, I'm able to actually, that's the first time I've said it. Other people have said it, but that's revolutionary. It is. A and when I said earlier that, like, we've sexualized somebody's gender non conforming, we've also sexualized this butch, fat woman. Well, and <laughs> I'm like, I don't know about that. No, I, I, I mean that, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I know you do, but I'm not there yet. But yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah. I, and again, you don't have to be. <laughs> I know, you're like, I know, this is my show, Abby. I know, I know. No, yeah. I'm just saying you don't have to agree with that. I, but yeah, like, I know. You've, yeah. you've put this character right. in a romantic situation yes. on yes, screen. It, for sure, yes. Yeah, it's like very empowering for other fat people. Yes. Because like Hollywood doesn't present fat people <laughs> at the percentage that they exist in the world. Right. Right? Right. It's like, yeah, exactly right. They don't. And I think also they don't do that with queer people or older people or like older love interests or... Yeah, they don't. It, it, it's like hidden. And I think the show's messy and real. I can't tell you how lucky I am. I mean, I always be like, I'm the luckiest motherfucker on the face of the planet. And I stand by that. Like, this is unreal. It's, it's unreal. And that is our show. As always, if you enjoyed the interview, please leave a comment on Apple Podcasts and help us spread the word with a tweet, a Facebook post, an Insta story. Doing things like that is the number one way you can help our show continue to grow. We did a big listener survey a couple months ago, and the number one thing that I learned is that the majority of listeners discovered our show through personal recommendation. So if you've done that, thank you so much. And if you haven't, hey, it is the perfect time to start. We're brought to you by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with GLAAD. I'm Jeffrey Masters on Twitter and Instagram at JeffMasters1. I'll see you next week. Bye.